Um, so uh, in this paper, what I want to think about is um, the, the three large-scale reflective field projects of the 1990s and 2000s, which are Les Leskernik, how do you pronounce it? Leskernik, Leskernik, I'll just say Leskernik, um, which took place on Bodmin Moor, Framework Archaeology, which took place at Heathrow Terminal 5 and at Stansted, and then probably the most internationally well-renowned one, uh, which is Chattel Quirk in Turkey. <coughs> and I think in the histories of archaeology, these are projects that aren't untold. We know about these projects and they, 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 their presence has entered mainstream narratives about histories of archaeological practice. And so you find them in things like textbooks about, about archaeology, uh, that these excavations took place. Um, uh, but where they're presented, they tend to, I've, in a, a, and I read about them, tend to, 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 to be presented as a sort of a thing, an experiment where archaeology did some reflexive experimental stuff. And, and that's kind of pre presented as something that's kind of separate, isolated from contemporary archaeological practice. Um, and in this paper, that's what I want to think about, whether that's actually the case or whether the reflexive projects of the 1990s and 2000s have, have uh, were they actually sort of contained in singular or have they impacted on the way that we practice today? Um, uh, and so I'll just, I'll just run through those projects very briefly. And I should start by saying that I didn't attend any of these projects, uh, so I have apologies if I present them uh, incorrectly in any way. Um, so um, uh, the Leskernik project uh, was published as Stone World, and the publication came out in about 2012, maybe? It's relatively recent, I know uh, it, uh, it came out relatively recently. But the project itself took place uh, between 1995 and 1999, it was directed by Sue Hamilton, Barbara Bender, and Chris Tilley. Uh, and um, it involved five related strands of research, archeological excavation and surface survey. This is of the Bronze Age uh, settlement of Les Kernick on, on Bodmin Moor. Uh, so excavation and surface survey of the Bronze Age village complex, geological and environmental surveys, production of installation artworks in the landscape, which you'll see in some of them there, um, uh, an anthropological study of the artificial community carrying out the research, and experimentation with written modes, with modes of written and visual representation uh, of place and landscape. So that's this project, and so sort of lots of brief activity about practice. The publication is great if you've not read it. It really sort of brings out the, sort of the tensions between uh, the people who were really into doing the theory. Uh, and the people who, who felt like they were doing the digging, whilst also sort of talking about the archaeology uh, as well. So uh, it's a really interesting and brings through, weaves through all these poems and things. Um, the second project is a, a, effectively a commercial uh, project, so framework archaeology, which was uh, sort of the bringing together of uh, Oxford and Wessex, um, uh, and uh, framework archaeology excavated uh, both uh, Heathrow Terminal 5 and Stansted, and the Terminal 5 stuff was one of the biggest uh, open area excavations in Britain until all the, uh, the HS1, HS2 stuff. Here's their little blurb from their website. Framework Archaeology is committed to a particular archaeological philosophy developed by BAA's archaeological consultants, Jill Andrews and John Barrett. This is concerned with understanding how people inhabited past landscapes. Archaeology is a study of people rather than deposits or objects. Framework projects are thus academically driven, but undertaken within a commercial environment. In order to fulfill the approach, a framework archaeology recording system places great emphasis on interpretation in addition to recording and developing a historical narrative as the site is excavated. So very much about recording in the field, computers in the field, post-its in the field, all this stuff that's you know, pretty cut, cutting edge at the time. And also, um, uh, my understanding is that the project, and as I said, attend it, so please feel free to correct me when I, I finish, but um, uh, my understanding is that it, it works in a very sort of nested way so that everyone's interpretation is fed up into, and you can, you can download those, they're, they're all available. But also, that meant that people sort of had very close training and support as well throughout the archaeological process. And then finally, uh, the project that we all uh, probably know most about or, or know of most, which is Chattel Hoyek, which uh, ran from 1993 until, until last year, I think. Um, and this is where it's most famous because of its association with Ian Hodder, who directed the project 
and uh, uh, sort of um, formulated his uh, interpretation of the Trowel's Edge work, which was published in 1997, uh, and it undoubtedly fed into the other, uh, other projects that I've mentioned. Um, this was uh, a project that uh, foregrounded multivocal perspectives, uh, innovative techniques with digital media and recording the archaeological process, having a site anthropologist, uh, recording uh, sort of experiences with dig diaries, breaking down barriers between diggers and find specialists, uh, and doing all the post ex on site, again, like framework, getting the information then and there on site to inform the interpretations, and lots of sort of innovative, cool stuff with digital modelling. So those are the, the three projects that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of referring to. Although, um, as I'll come on to shortly, there, there is others that, that we consider, but I just wanted to sort of think about these three big ones, because they're pretty big, big projects and have employed a lot of people or, or trained a lot of people. Um, and before I go further, I should say that I'm conscious that um, uh, none of these projects are without controversy. There's a lot to say about them. They elicited lots of passionate uh, uh, reactions. Uh, and again, I'll come back to, to this too uh, shortly. But I, I'm less interested, in a way, in these projects. I'm more interested in the legacy that they've had. Um, and so um, uh, in the rest of the paper, um, what I want to, to do is trace those legacies of those reflexive projects. Have they influenced and impacted contemporary practice today? That's what I want to ask. Um, uh, so we can look at pretty traditional legacies in terms of outputs. Um, so uh, the books, so there's the Stone World's book that I mentioned. Um, for, um, uh, for, for framework, one of the things that I think even uh, um, sort of talking with John Murray that he said is this it had such an exciting and innovative uh, methodology and way of training and then the output has actually been quite a traditional um, uh, publication. Um, obviously for uh, the other projects the outputs are more experimental, certainly Stonewalls is a really experimental book. Um, Chapel Hoyek has, has uh, there's a, a string of publications associated with that and continuing work on uh, digital um, media and, uh, and digital engagement that's going on there. So that's a paper that Sarah Perry and two people have just brought out uh, 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 about the, the, the digital work. So traditional legacies, publications, data, the websites are all there uh, as well, uh, and they're all, they've all got nice up-to-date, well, well, nice detailed websites. Um, so in that sense, these are pretty traditional legacies. Another legacy I think it, that we that we can see really clearly is that these projects have influenced other projects to happen. So I'm not now. I, so now I'm going to make a bold claim because I'm not. Again, this is uh, something. This is a project that Adrian Chapik uh, alerted me to. The Hundred Minories project, uh, which was undertaken by LP Archaeology. I don't know if anyone was involved. Is anyone here involved in that? Oh, oh, oh you. Yeah. Oh, were you involved in it as well? Oh, well, there we go. Well, maybe, I don't know, well, there we go. There, really, excellent. Now I can make the bold claim that it would be true that this is something where, uh, therefore, the kind of uh, ideas of, of, of those reflexive projects, you can see it really clearly here, that the archaeologists were given a voice in this. So, hang on a second, let me take a step back. It's an excavation <coughs> that looked at a, a large-scale open area excavation at London's ancient city wall peeling back eight metres of dense urban stratigraphy from AD 50 onward, the 100, 100 Minories Research Project is uncovering a unique corner of London's history. That's, the, that's what the uh, website says. Um, but um, again, it's a really uh, uh, funky and innovative use of digital uh, methods so that they could put things out there straight away for people to look at. To for the, they use the website to foreground archaeologists. There were little micro projects that went on there was the 100 Minories uh, uh, Symposium. Uh, so uh, a really uh, 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 sort of clear legacy in this project. It took place between 2014 and 15. Um, uh, so their website says about the data, whilst all archaeological information is somewhat limited and inconclusive until the final post-excavation analyses are completed, we believe at 100 Minories that commercial excavations should be happy to work in an open and transparent way, making our interpretations public even as they're developing. This website represents this state of knowledge in flux. Our hypotheses and ideas should change as the site gives up its secrets. 
Um, so and there you can download all of their online data. So it's really a, a really cool uh, example. This is also where I come into this. My own project, the Ardna Merca Transitions Project, was really influenced by uh, all of these projects. We excavate on the north coast of the Ardna Merca Peninsula, uh, which is the most westerly point of the UK mainland. Um, <clears throat> it's extremely remote uh, in Ardna Merca, and um, uh, therefore there's amazing preservation. And so we've been excavating there since 2006, and we could just carry on for all of our lives, I think because it's beautiful and the, everything's brilliantly preserved. So we've been digging everything from the Neolithic right through to the Highland Clearances uh, uh, and we've just found wonderful, lovely archaeology. Um, and we're interested, obviously, in that and in change over time. That's why we put ourselves the Transitions Project. But we're also a place where we're really interested in changing. We're really uh, in training. I'm really interested in um, uh, engaging the community. So uh, one of the project directors is Phil Richardson from Archaeology Scotland, uh, and really interested in reflexive uh, uh, multi vocal methods uh, of, of digging. So, we've developed our own contact sheets um, that sort of draw on things like uh, 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 the, the work of all the reflexive projects and um, other things like intervention forms, participant forms, or sort of recording processes that are designed to sort of capture multiple voices and foreground students within the, the, the and, and, and diggers within the, 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 the interpretation process. We've not yet written it up properly, so whether uh, we will capture that is another thing that we would like to. Um, so, so there's a legacy in itself. And then there's the legacy of, 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 of influencing other people through training and media. So uh, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed your session, uh, uh, Colleen. Uh, this was a chat uh, just over a month ago, a session about rethinking con uh, contact sheets. Uh, and so we wrote contact sheets for our phones and then we designed contact sheets for our phones. Uh, and, and, and I think it's no, you know, it's no surprise that that's run by two people who uh, were at Chapel Hook and there's a picture. That's, yeah. that's at Chapel Hook. Yeah. <laughs> um, but and so, so those legacies are really clear. That was a, a large group of people from across the sector thinking creatively about what we want to do for, with, with context sheets to what kind of voices, what kind of things we want to capture in context sheets. Uh, and so that's, that, that's a, had a real sort of um, uh, 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 tangible uh, uh, legacy uh, uh, impact. So um, this is all sort of really demonstrative but I think there's got to be at least a thousand, probably two thousand archaeologists must have gone through those three projects, maybe more. Uh, I would love to have the time to sit down and just work it out uh, and count them all up. Certainly on the Chapel Clearwater website, all the uh, participants are, are there are listed. Um, um, and so beyond these kind of formal and clearly demonstrable connections, I wondered about the sort of less obvious legacy and how these projects have uh, and still continue to reach into people's lives and their practices and how in turn that's then passed on to to others so um i ran a <laughs> short survey um so i should say that this is this is like um uh, uh, this whole session really reflects my nerdy in interest in the development of contemporary archaeology uh, it, it's so fascinating to see as a profession how we developed and i um uh, did apply for some funding to do a, a larger study, but I didn't get it. But it was in a day when I didn't really know how to do funding applications, so maybe I should reapply. And um, so I call this a pilot in brackets survey. Um, I just made a short survey. I disseminated it via Twitter this year. You can still add to it if you want. It's a it's a Google form. You can take a photo and just go to it there if you want to con uh, contribute. Only 17 people contributed, uh, but that gives us a, an, an all right sort of basis for some discussion. And I asked just four questions. Which project did you attend? When? And what's your current job? And how do you think attending the project um, has affected your practice subsequently? So what I really wanted to know was how people felt being on these reflective projects, has, has what, what their, the legacy is for them. Uh, it was an, it's anonymous. I called the participants RLP1, so Reflective Legacies Pilot 1 and 2 and 3 and so on. 
And then the rest of the paper, I'll just give you an idea of, of, of what those kind 17 people all said. Um, so most of the people who replied either attended Chattel Hoyuk or Framework, or uh, in the case of two people, both uh, uh, they attended both of those. Only one person uh, went to Les Clinic uh, and, uh, and replied. Uh, and um, they're pretty uh, uh, equal in terms of what they do. Uh, eight people are in academia, six were in commercial archaeology, and then there's one self-employed archaeologist. I don't know where, what sector they are, so I'll just put them there. And two people who are no longer in archaeology. And what's really interesting is that you can see very clearly the, the impact on their, their own excavation uh, practice. So uh, this person says... Um, uh, it's affected their practice in RLP 12, says, in their use of theory and interpretation, and then the practical ways in which I plan projects and excavate. Uh, RLP 18 says um, it fundamentally influenced the way they do archaeology. RLP 7 says they developed a greater professionalism and systematic approach to recording. They went on to become a planning archaeologist, so there we go. Um, uh, and RLP 14 says, the integration of interpretation with the process of excavation has definitely stayed with me and has influenced my subsequent con uh, practice uh, uh, to a great extent. For example, context sheets uh, I now use in my own excavations feature larger than usual boxes for interpretation. Incorporating digital methods in field practice was also an important aspect and something that stayed with me and something that I will emphasise in my own field work. What's really interesting and important to flag up is that of these people, most of them are in relatively senior positions and positions to influence other people. So seven of the eight academics were lecturers and the, the, the other one was a doctoral student, but you know, clearly was there a teaching assistant too. Five of the eight, uh, um, uh, 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 sorry, and um, all of the people who answered from the commercial sector are in senior managerial roles. Um, and so, <coughs> including po uh, a post ex manager. So, these are people who've attended these reflexive projects and are in positions of influence uh, to, to pass on their experiences. And many said they did, um, both in terms of impacting training on others. So, RLP9 says uh, they attended both Chattel Hook and Framework. Both projects had a profound impact on how I approached my own work and how I ran excavations later in my career. The way I trained others and taught certain principles, particularly those learned at Terminal 5, was undoubtedly taken from my earlier experiences. And I don't think you can separate training from the, sort of, uh, the importance of, of valuing multiple voices. Uh, and, and here, a couple of people, RLP7 said, it made me realise the extent to which excavation and post-excavation teams so rarely communicate within archaeology. Uh, I now endeavour to acknowledge the opinions of all multiple of multiple specialists and believe that all field staff should understand the post ex process and vice versa. Uh, and um, RLP 14 says similar thing to give a voice to the excavators on such a large project by allowing them to feed into make it, uh, interpretations was really important. Um, on my own field works, I always pay attention to the ideas, opinions, and interpretations of those who are actively excavating. So that's just a, a, a quick summary of uh, that study. Um, I should probably add a couple of important caveats. And one of them is the, the really cool thing that it, we shouldn't see these projects in isolation, uh, both in terms of the way they impact practice, but also the way that they were impa impacted too. So RLP 16 says, um, some technical aspects of the recording at, at Chattel was influential, such as the way small finds and samples were all linked to the contact number directly. Basically, how the Museum of London recording system had been so well adapted to the site. So the, the, the Museum of London recording system feeding into Chattel work and then presumably feeding out into whatever else they do. The other important caveat is that obviously it's not simply a rosy picture. Uh, this person, RLP 17, said... Uh, working at Chapel had very little impact on my methodology of my research. And then RLP 16 uh, told us basically that they had a very problematic time at Chapel Hook uh, where there was quite a lot of separation. The relationship between diggers and academics was much worse than, for example, between specialists and myself when writing up excavations in the UK. The interactions were always very one sided. Um, they said they had an amazing time, it's an amazing site. But it was probably the least reflexive site I have ever worked on. I have been a field archaeologist for 20 years and worked in the UK and internationally. So, um, so, so it's important to recognise that there is nuance and not everyone had the same experiences. 
And I just felt really bad that, that I haven't mentioned Leskinet because only one person said it. This is the, the thing that they said. And they went on, for, for, they, they've given us quite a sort of detailed view of what they, what they took to the project, what they got from it. Um, one of the things that they say is that they, they recognise that you can bring art and archaeology together. Um, uh, it taught them that archaeology could accommodate all of the different ways of doing things. Also, when they walk, when they go on sites, um, they uh, still think about sort of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the experience of landscape. The other thing, very quickly, because I realise I'm over time, is um, that there are legacies uh, of these projects beyond archaeology. So RLP 15 worked on framework and is now an IT contractor. They said, I helped design many of the underlying recording systems. I have a profound interest in the differences between data, information and knowledge. I used to consider this in terms of archaeological engagement. I now do this on a more broader basis and include ontologies and other mechanisms of knowledge, representation and reasoning. And I think that's really cool that these legacies stretch outside of archaeology as well into other sectors. So, um, this is a, a, a really short study. Uh, and um, I'm sure I've got something intellectual somewhere on one of these. Um, but I think it points to the meaningful impact that these projects have had on British archaeology uh, and uh, likely, well, uh, definitely onto North American archaeology and, and in parts of Europe as well. Um, and um, I think we probably do these projects a disservice if we fail to, to realise their potential and their methodological innovation uh, if we don't sort of continue their tradition of reflexivity and reflecting on their impact. I also, I think, you know, in this, session, this session is a very politically oriented session talking about archaeological activism. And um, I suppose in, in many ways I've, I've neutralised this by just talking about reflexivity. But the processes that we're talking about, about foregrounding diggers, uh, about uh, listening to voices, about sort of interpretation of the trail's edge, and about, about presenting archaeology differently to communities uh, and presenting archaeologists differently and, and things like that are, are all uh, owe a legacy themselves to a lot of the projects that we've seen in the rest of the session today. Um, and so I, I think I sort of want to conclude by saying there's still so much more to say. I'd really like to uh, do a bigger piece of research and do this as kind of ethnography. To be honest, listening to everyone's papers today, I'd just like to do a massive ethnography of all the archaeological practices. I like the fact that Kate said, you know, this is a um, archaeology is finding its way really in terms of what we are and how we practice, and and having that documented somewhere would be would be brilliant. Um, so to to wrap up about these uh, projects, I think the important thing to recognise uh, is that the the histories that we tell of these projects um, can't be something that we tell as some, something that was bounded and fixed and happened in the past. Just like the histories that we told in the rest of this session today. These aren't things that happened in the past. These are things that reach into our contemporary practice in multiple ways and in multiple politicised ways as well. Thank you very much.